Thank you for this occasion to sort of reflect on some of the things that are, are uh, going on. It's obviously a time of uh, uh, turmoil, of great uncertainty. I'm sure uh, Misha would like you to all go to the, uh, I guess it's sold out, but this uh, series on, on uh, an age of uncertainty. Um, let me, I'm, I'm going to focus uh, particularly on, on the economics, but I, uh, it's going to turn out my view is that the economics really depends very much on the politics. Uh, we're in a peculiar situation where there's a debate going on about whether the world is about to face a serious uh, recession, an economic downturn, and inflation. And normally those two are the opposite sides of the coin. If the economy is weak, uh, you have deflation. You've been worried about def deflation. When the economy is strong, you have inflation. And this goes back to a, a period uh, we haven't had this combination of a weak economy and inflation for a very long time. Uh, in understanding whether uh, that will occur, there are, as I said, lots of uncertainties, uh, many of which we have very little control over. Uh, there's the war. How long will Putin uh, continue this war? Um, there are some questions of resolve on the part of Europe and the United States, which I'll come to later. Uh, we are still, uh, COVID-19 is not behind us. Uh, I noticed no, most people here are not having masks, but uh, COVID-19 is real in China. And uh, that's important because China is the producer of the world. And uh, if there's a problem in China, there are supply, uh, supply side problems. And those supply side problems are behind the inflation. So that's a big uh, uncertainty. We can't do very much about uh, either. We can do some things about, um, you know, strategically thinking about how to induce Putin to act in a more rational way. But when you're dealing with somebody who is irrational, uh, figuring out how to change behavior is really difficult because it's, uh, by their nature, uh, unpredictable. And actually, there's an aspect of game theory where you want to pretend to be irrational, even it's rational to at least pretend to be irrational. So we don't know whether he is rationally irrational or irrationally irrational. And uh, that's just, you know, we have to deal with that uncertainty about uh, whether uh, uh, what, what is the nature of, of uh, Putin. Um, and we could do something about COVID-19, but very little about COVID-19 in China. So we have to limit, we have to understand the limits of what we can do. But uh, a lot of the uncertainties about the winter in Europe are uh, about the politics in Europe. And uh, a lot of what is going on a lot of the pain that was uh, referred to uh, is self-inflicted. Uh, the basic stance that I would take is uh, Europe, the United States, is at war uh, with Russia. Uh, it's a war of uh, Russia uh, has broken international norms. It's attacked a neighbor. Uh, it's broken and, and, and by breaking international law. Uh, we have, I think there has to be resolve uh, of the West uh, to uh, stop this. Um, under it's so understandable why a place like uh, Press Club would feel, should feel very strongly about it because Russia does not honor uh, anything about freedom of press, freedom of speech. And so anybody committed to those human rights should think this, this is a war that we have to win. Uh, and I'm certainly on that side, that this is, you know, I am uh, basically on, uh, against most of the wars, against the war in Iraq. I wrote a book about that, the war in Afghanistan. Those were wars of choice that I think we were very foolish. This is a war that has been imposed on us by Russia seeking to expand its borders. We can talk about whether we played with the tail of the wolf and got it angry. 
I don't think uh, there would have been any difference if we hadn't played with the tail uh, of this wolf. I think it, it, it's a war of uh, restoration of the empire. But whether that's, uh, you know, whether we helped aggravate that wolf or whether this is just a war of restoration of empire doesn't make any difference in my mind. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, uh, this kind of, of uh, aggression is not allowed to occur. Um, Europe has been, uh, uh, um, you know, Burrell and, and other European leaders, I think, have been much clearer in defining what I just described as the objective of the war than the United States, which has sometimes gotten confused, particularly in the Republican Party, because uh, they describe it as a war of democracy versus authoritarian. It has an element of that, but when Biden went to Saudi Arabia to get uh, additional supplies of oil, it made it clear that our side is not a side of democracies. <laughs> we have many uh, despots on our side. Uh, but these have not attacked another country. So, uh, you know, I wish it, I mean, we need to, to clearly uh, see the world as divided between authoritarian regimes and democracies in which the authoritarian regimes are expanding. But this particular war is a war to try to stop Russian aggression. But it has to be seen as embedded in a broader conflict of democracy versus authoritarian regimes. And that how we conduct that war, obviously, is going to affect how we win, how we w conduct the narrower war may affect how we do in the broader war. And I'll make some remarks at the end about how we're failing in that broader war against authoritarianism. But most of my remarks are about the narrower war about Russian aggression. My main uh, concern is that Europe and the United States, as I said, have not realized that we are at war. And uh, there, when countries go to war, uh, they don't just leave their economy as if it was at a peace, peace time. Wartime economies are different from peacetime. You still use markets, but you control markets a lot more. There are shortages. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's a natural politics of not wanting to admit you're at war. It's what the United States has done in every war that it's engaged in since World War II. We've tried to pretend that we're not at war. We call them uh, special operation. No, that's what Russia calls it. Uh, we, we, uh, we don't have names for it, uh, uh, but uh, we have not declared war uh, since World War II. Uh, so we try to say it's, it's something else, but it is a war. And uh, Russia has imitated us in that way. And we, as we went to war in Iraq and Afghanistan, we tried to tell American people this was uh, just, you know, a few mercenaries. No, we don't call them mercenaries. Uh, we, uh, a few people that we recruited, poor people for whom were mostly African Americans, for whom this is the best opportunity to go forward. It's terrible that American society for African Americans this often is the best opportunity for them. But those are the people who've been fighting our wars. And it's been very clear that we don't want uh, mainstream Americans to feel that we are at war when we go to war. And uh, I believe Europe is trying to do the same thing now, uh, and the United States. Uh, we don't want the, the kind of sense of insecurity, threat that war uh, is often associated with war, and the sense of disturbance, the kind of debate. But it seems to me so clear that um, 
uh, by Europe particularly, by not owning up to the fact that it's at war, will in fact make the people suffer a lot more. Now, uh, let me uh, first talk about uh, the inflation and the way we are responding to it. And uh, again, my argument is that the way the central banks are responding to it will cause a much deeper recession or downturn than is necessary. This is a policy mistake. Uh, the idea is a very simple one. Uh, most inflation, almost all inflationary episodes, except the very couple, have been caused, for excesses of, caused by excesses of demand. Uh, this, like uh, the oil price shock uh, 50 years ago, uh, is caused by a, a supply side shock. Um, shortages that began under COVID-19 and had nothing to do with the war. And that was the impetus. And uh, now those uh, problems have been exacerbated by the war. Um, and once you see it through that lens, you realize that raising interest rates is not going to do very much about the problem. So uh, the original in the United States, uh, uh, at the core of uh, uh, the inflation early on, was used cars and new cars. And that was caused by a market failure. The car companies, except for Tesla, forgot I should, uh, to order chips. Uh, you know, it's a market failure. Uh, we, uh, uh, and that chip shortage resulted in a car shortage and we let markets work and uh, the result was prices went up. It wasn't as if we didn't have car plants. It wasn't as if we had forgotten how to produce cars. As it wasn't as if we had been at war and some of the, you know, the, the plants had been destroyed. No, it was just a shortage of chips. One critical part of a car resulted in inflation. And uh, differences in, the, in uh, the way we measure inflation between Europe and the United States explained a very large fraction of the difference in inflation. So people looked at the differences in inflation and tried to interpret it with all kinds of stories. It was a measurement problem. We used different metrics uh, for measuring used cars in particular. Uh, there are, are a whole, were a whole set of shortages. Um, many um, people thought at the beginning that the shortages uh, were transitory and therefore the prices increases were transitory and they have proved more permanent than <clears throat> was expected. All of that says is that we thought the market was better than we should have. The market was much worse. <laughs> and that's part of the, uh, Misha talked about my critique of neoliberalism it was short-sighted, it didn't invest in resilience, and nobody could believe that our economy was as, uh, had as little resilience as it did. So when somebody says, oh they, they, oh, they underestimated inflation, what they were really saying is they overestimated the competence of markets. And markets proved really bad. Uh, poster child of that was the fact that the United States couldn't even have massive shortages of baby formula of the kind that you saw in the Soviet Union. You know, empty shelves, woman feminine pro products. Why? In that particular case, every one of these shortages has a different story or many stories, and I could go through each of them, but you know, we don't have time. But the baby formula shortage was we had allowed markets to get more and more concentrated. Market power, we didn't do anything about it. 
One company produced half the baby formula. It wasn't a question of globalization. It was one American company produced half the formula in the United States. And when that company didn't pay enough attention to health, short-sighted uh, behavior, putting profits ahead of the health of the babies, and they were found out, the plant, they were shut down. And that created a shortage. The market is supposed to be diversified, small firms, all competing against each other. That's not the American economy that we have today. So uh, the American economy proved very unresilient and took, uh, is taking time to resolve these supply side shortages. Good news is they are, some of these, like automobiles, are being resolved or will be resolved uh, within a few months. Uh, but it's taken a long time. But meanwhile, there are things in, in China have gone very badly, and, and there are all kinds of, of uh, shortages that are likely to show up. The good news is a lot of the shipping bottlenecks have been resolved. So it's a mixed picture with, with uh, a lot uh, of uncertainty. But that provides sort of the background for why there was an underestimate of inflation. It was an excess of confidence in markets. But then, on top of that, we had the war. And um, here, uh, at the very beginning of the war, uh, many, you know, with Russia being a large producer and Europe uh, uh, becoming, uh, being so dependent on Russian gas, uh, it was clear that there was going to be an energy crisis in February and March. And it was, uh, should have been clear that once Ukraine showed its resolve to win, it should have been clear that something should be done about that. Now, economists are, you know, Europe was, was uh, when the sanctions were imposed, uh, there, among economists, there, there are, you might say, two views. Uh, one, very hard to impose global sanctions on a commodity like oil, and that circumvention is very easy unless you have global support. And here is a uh, aspect of, of uh, this war that I think uh, one has to uh, take into account. Um, in the beginning, the first couple of resolutions at the UN, uh, Russia got almost universally condemned, except by a few authoritarian, extreme authoritarian regimes. But if you've been following it, support for the war has waned in the third world. And uh, the West, and particularly Germany, has a lot to blame for that. Because the context, uh, as I said, is that we are just been through COVID-19, and we engaged in vaccine apartheid, vaccine hoarding. The West miraculous development of the mRNA vaccines in record times, production, but when India and South Africa came knocking at our door and said, can we use the intellectual property? We have the means of producing this drug, if you just allow us to use your intellectual property, Germany said no. We'd rather see your people die rather than our drug companies take a hit. Even though the framework of compulsory licenses had been agreed at, upon in the Uruguay round when the WTO was set up and renewed when we faced the HIV AIDS epidemic, 
The drug companies had devised ways of dragging their feet in the complexity of our mRNA, which had nailed many uh, patents, made it such that compulsory licenses were, the principle was there, but that we needed an answer quickly, and they were not set up. So it wasn't a change in the framework of international law. It was a, a recognition that at this moment of time, we needed to act quickly, and a, wave of, a waiver of intellectual property rights. We succeeded in persuading President Biden that this was an issue of global concern, and he advocated for it, but Germany said no. And that was vital in stopping access to vaccines and central to today's lack of support for uh, the West. Uh, of course, coming on a history of colonialism and oppression and all that, but, but it is, it is uh, the feeling at the moment uh, couldn't be stronger. So uh, once you recognize that you don't have global support, uh, obviously other countries are going to go, want to get your oil. So uh, Russia's gas dependence was, I mean, Germany's gas dependence on gas was very, very foolish. I wrote about this in my book, Making Globalization Work, back in 2006, where I said, you know, Russia is not a reliable supplier. And because gas, substituting for it is much more difficult, it is foolish for Germany and Europe to be so dependent on Russian gas. Obviously, Germany didn't pay any attention to what I wrote uh, then. Uh, the, you know, but it, it, it didn't take a, a genius to see that Russia under Yeltsin and then under Putin was not reliable. And yet you put all the eggs in one basket in a, in a particularly, you know, theory that interdependence would lead to <clears throat> good behavior. Uh, but it was a theory that I think uh, no one today uh, would uh, uh, support. So uh, the, um, at the beginning of the war, as I said, it was either clear that the sanctions would not work because circumvention was easy, or that they would work, and the price of oil would go way up, unless Saudi Arabia responded. And Saudi Arabia has not responded. So we have a peculiar situation actually right now that economists find a little bit difficult to understand. Um, it's partly political. Saudi Arabia could have produced more and that would have made a difference, but it hasn't. Circumvention has been very strong. Some estimates of the global supply, the difference of global supply is relatively low, and that makes it hard to understand the magnitude of the increase in the price. Out of, out of uh, sync with the magnitude of the reduction in supply. Well, a lot of this is markets don't operate very well in the short run. The price has come way down. And as, a, you know, as an economist, I look at this and say, the long-run price of oil, we know what that is. I mean, the long-run price of energy, we know what that is. We can produce almost as much renewable energy as we want at a very low price, the equivalent of probably less than, well less than $60, $50 a barrel of oil, much less. And that's the cap where we're going to be. And so in my mind, uh, this is a temporary aberration in the price of energy and oil. What we should have done back in March is to have massive expansion of renewable energies to full capacity using the equivalent of what we have in the United States called the Defense Production Act. Realize you're at war, 
command your resources, say this is not a peacetime economy. We used the Defense Production Act during the war against COVID-19. Australia used the equivalent of a Defense Production Act. So they realized that there is a war against COVID-19 and we used, we went beyond market mechanisms. We should have done that here. But making <clears throat> the disturbances of the coming winter particularly bad in Europe is that the structure of the energy market is very flawed. It was based on a neoliberal view of energy, structuring the energy market, of deregulation, you divide it into three parts. It was something that we tried in the United States. I don't know if many of you remember when California deregulated. And it was a disaster. There was market manipulation. And this is even without a war. We had market manipulation. Prices went way up. There were all kinds of stories about what was underlying it. The right said, oh, it's because the left is trying to regulate, is trying to push renewable energy. If we just had dirty coal, all would be well. So they tried to blame it on all, you know, on attempts to have a, a better environment, environmental regulation. And then we figured out it was market manipulation. And we re-regulated and all the shortages disappeared. Prices stabilized. And Europe should have learned that lesson. The um, you might say the one good thing about that was Enron, which was the company engaged in that market manipulation, went bankrupting. So it got its punishment from the market. But the basic story is so clear of what's going on right now in uh, is clear in the United States. Um, we are energy neutral. We don't import or export energy in the United States. So. There is no, you know, what's going on, you might say, in the rest of the world shouldn't make any difference to us. We don't depend on Russia and oil. And yet, prices of gas and oil have gone way up. They're not coming down. What was it? It was a massive redistribution from ordinary customers to Exxon and the other oil companies and gas companies. Did it have much incentive effect? No. Nobody builds, nobody does oil exploration or even opens up a, a fracking gas field on the belief about prices today. It had no production incentive. It had a little bit of incentive of people to conserve, but very little. And you could have done all the incentives that you needed at the margin without the redistributive effect by using nonlinear prices. So there was a lack of imagination about that. But even if you hadn't done that, you could have had windfall profits taxes. They were windfall profits. Capturing those profits and then redistributing it to the people who are suffering. It's the second best way of doing it. Using nonlinear prices would have been a lot better. But Europe, things are even worse. You take a country like Norway, which is a net exporter of energy, and price of electricity has gone up multifold. And people in their country say, why are we paying more for electricity? The water doesn't cost any more, and the hydroelectric or gas doesn't cost any more, and yet our citizens are suffering an enormous amount. What's going on here? Why should they pay for this war in that way? And again, I, I think it's all politics. It's all about the European energy market and how it's structured. So what I try to argue here is that 
Uh, you could have organized it differently. You still can. You could have made more efforts at, an, uh, at a European level to, to produce more energy quickly. Couldn't have made up fully for the gap. But the gap is in the global energy market is much smaller because of the magnitude of circumvention. So, it's, it, you know, unfortunately, you know, a, a tariff where you try to, to take advantage of transaction costs to make sure that Russian gas and oil gets a lower price. Hard to fully implement, but that's where we are now months and months after the war began. That should have been at the very beginning. And it should have been obvious that that's what you needed to do so that even as Russia sells the gas and oil on the global market, it receives less. Let me say, just as a parenthesis, the import restrictions are very effective. Not allowing Russia to have uh, chips, uh, depriving it of access to international financial markets, that side of the story is a very effective uh, mechanism. So uh, I'm, I'm very strongly in favor of those sanctions and trying everything that one can. But when just the, the sanctions against oil are a delicate matter that was not well managed. It was right that we should try it, but it was not done well. Well, um, where are we uh, going forward? Well, I hope that Europe wakes up and realizes it's at war and changes the economic response. I am not very optimistic about central banks waking up. It's almost in their DNA that when they see inflation, they raise interest rates. They don't want to be irrelevant. It's just the nature of politics. If you're given a job, you do it. And you hear that, you know, we're behind the ball, all kinds of stories like that. So unfortunately, uh, unless the voices on the other side get louder, uh, what is going to be going on is what I use, the analogy I use is uh, medieval bloodletting. Uh, I don't know if you know, you know medieval uh, bloodletting, what they do is uh, the theory was that you had bad humors in your blood and you had to let them go, uh, out so they uh, 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 took blood out of you. Uh, when you had a disease. Now, did people recover when you let out their blood? Now, usually they got worse. But what did that, how did the medieval blood letters, idea, they had an ideology. How did they respond? They said, ah, the problem is we haven't let out enough blood. And they let out more until the patient died. Or, God intervened, and he didn't intervene very often. Well, that's where the central, that's central, the model of central banks, if you want to. They will raise the interest rates until they get inflation under control. In, uh, raising interest rates operates with long and variable legs, usually 18 months, and inflation will not be control it. It won't affect the supply of oil and gas and, and food and all that. We know how to produce food, but it's not. Raising interest rates actually makes it more difficult because it makes it more difficult to make the investment that you need. And there's another theory that in imperfectly competitive markets, raising interest rates encourages firms to focus on the short run, and that means raising their prices. So it's actually something that may, are, is counterproductive. So it won't solve the inflation problem. And what are they going to do? Raise the interest rates more until the patient is, dies. Well, the patient here dying means we go into recession. Deep enough recession, inflation does get tempered. So I am very pessimistic unless there is enough political pressure on our central banks to make them wake up and say, we're in a different world. Um, I hope that uh, those who are responsible for the European energy market realize, too, that a lot of the high energy prices are self-inflicted and change the way the European energy market works. Um, and 
uh, uh, if they do that, the winter will be much better than if they if they don't. Uh, should I say a word about America, or should I stop and open it up for questions? Let's open it up for questions, sir. Well, thank you very much. Uh, wow, that was quite the broad brush, but deep insight into the flaws of uh, the uh, modern neoliberal world that we're working in, and you have unveiled some of the mist that exists around all of these uh, issues. So I'll open it up. We have 15 minutes uh, for Q&A. Uh, so please raise your hand and do introduce yourself. Uh, yes, please. And just wait for the microphone, please. We'll take two questions and then come back. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for this insightful speech. I'm Karolina Zbotniewska from Poland, from Euractiv. You said that central banks need to accept that we are in a different world, in a war economy. So uh, if you could tell us uh, what exactly should they do when they accept that? Okay, and we'll take... Point by point. <laughs> we'll take one more question back there, please. Thank you. Monica Graf, Salzburger Nachrichten. Uh, more or less uh, same way of question. You said the, the European energy markets should uh, change. In what way uh, should they change? What is the first or second things they should do? Thank you. Thank you. Back to you, Jeff. Good. Okay. Um, the, the thing that central banks should do is to recognize that this is a supply side inflation. And, you know, there are some things that are uh, beyond your control. And uh, you, you, you should, uh, sometimes the cure is worse than the disease. So, um, they should say this is a kind of inflation that directly is not in our hands. And we're just going to accept it. You know, we've gotten a disease here, and it has to run its course. Uh, rather than giving it the wrong medicine, it's better to recognize the limitations that we have. Uh, but when you say that, you should give some note of optimism. Uh, when the inflation broke earlier, they made a mistake and they said it's very temporary because they thought markets were more resilient than they were. But they could have said, look, if we make the investments in renewable energy, the price will come down faster. But even if we don't, we know what the long run price of energy is. It's not going to continue to go from 30 to 60 to 90 to 120 to 240. So the, the idea that it would continue to rise at that rate and therefore there would be that kind of inflationary momentum from energy just is wrong. There's a natural limit to that, to, to that inflation. In fact, it goes the other way. That we know that when we don't use renewable, uh, depletable natural resources like oil for a while because price is high. We have more oil in the future. And what does that mean? Well, if we're going to get, be getting our target of carbon neutrality by 2050, we have more oil around. And what does that mean? After this episode, prices are going to fall even more below the path that they were on. So we could have given, you know, a realization that this is a temporary episode of inflation and that there will be disinflation. The same thing, cars. Inflation, but then there's going to be disinflation because cars are going to go back to normal price. Food. We've spent 50 years telling farmers not to farm. We could tell farmers to farm. It's a revolutionary idea, but we could do it. We probably won't have to because prices will come back to normal. But if there were any inkling that they were not come back to normal, we just tell them, go farm. 
So there are so many <clears throat> forces restoring these sectoral demands. One way of thinking about it. Monetary policy is about aggregate demand, and these disturbances were sectoral demand. And they're real, and they're demand versus supply, but they're sectoral. And blunt instruments like monetary policy don't do that. Now, in other countries, there is a recognition that you can use monetary policy in a more fine-tuned way, but that goes against the neoliberal model of Europe. What do I mean by that? You could say we will provide at low interest rates capital to anybody that wants to invest in renewable energy or in food or in any of the other shortages. Let's target monetary policy to increase the supply of things that are in shortage. Now that's a radical idea. <laughs> but I think it's a common sense idea. You wouldn't want to do it normally because in more normal times, markets are working relatively well. But this is war. And that's why I say there, there is just not a recognition. You know, they're too wedded to the wrong ideology. Now, the same thing is the answer to your question about uh, the energy market. Uh, Deregulation, I said, never worked. Um, the char characteristic of the European energy market that's most salient here is that the price of electricity is related to the highest cost source of production, the marginal cost. And economists are very, very wedded to marginal cost pricing. And they believe it's uh, the basis of efficiency. And in normal times, there is a lot to be said for it. But you can still do that, and that's where I talked about nonlinear pricing. You say to consumers, you pay the same price for energy that you did last year, as long as you consume less than 80% or 90% of what you consumed last year. But if you consume more than 90 or 80 to 90%, you pay a much higher price. And if you consume more than 120%, you pay even a higher price. And obviously, you make exceptions for people who are in special circumstances and so forth. Well, that's a system where if you've just consumed 80 or 90%, you have no bigger bill than you did before. But at the margin, you have a lot of incentives. But if you use what we call linear prices, make them pay that high price for all they consume, you, you know, if they're spending 5% of their budget on energy, on electricity, and you allow the price of electricity to go up tenfold, that's 50% of their budget. People can't do that. And a element of common sense and humanity would have said, you don't do that. So there are many ways of restructuring the energy market. I just gave you one example, and it's obviously much more complicated. But the basic idea was electricity price was linked to the highest cost, uh, uh, the marginal. And, and that was gas. And when gas went up tenfold, the price of electricity went up tenfold. And as I said, in Norway, it didn't cost any more for the water. I mean, it's a little bit more complicated because Climate change has affected the supply of water and a lot of, the, of other things are going on. But you, the average cost of production did not go up anywhere near in tandem with the price of electricity. And you could have used marginal cost pricing at the margin and protected people. Great. We'll take two more questions uh, here. In, uh, wait for the microphone, please, Paul. Thank you, Professor. Uh, my name is Pavel Demesh. I'm from Bratislava, Slovakia. I have two questions, one America-related, and second to you and George Soros-related. First one, uh, 
for us looking at U.S. and U.S. leadership, and you very rightly said that we live in over-dominance of politics today, over economy and over everything, practically. How come that after all what Donald Trump did, he still can think about running for president? <laughs> and uh, second, uh, George Soros is a rather demonized person in our region. Uh, and uh, surely you know him well. How different you and him are in assessing today's economic situation and namely how to get out of all those troubles which we are seeing in economy. Where you agree and where would you disagree with George Soros? Just behind you, Pavel, please. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Siglitz. Thank you very much for the presentation. My name is Olivia Lazard. I work with Carnegie Europe and I'm associated with the AWM. As you mentioned, the, research, the recession is supply chain related. How much credit do you give to European wishes more than plans to reindustrialize re at home? How much does it conflict at the moment with the type of neoliberal policies or monetary policies that you were talking about? And how much does it conflict with the debt crisis that is coming? Okay. Uh, okay. Well, uh, no, 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 no. We'll, we'll take one here and then the one in the back and that's it. Sorry, we're strapped for time. Yes, this is, this is from our online audience. Uh, it's from uh, Aline Goetz, who is an Austrian freelance editor uh, residing <coughs> in Greece. Her question is uh, basically, um, what you said about the supply side nature and the demand side, but what, sorry, I'm in the wrong question. Uh, as you already hinted, it's not very likely to expect a turn in government's response actions. So the question for normal citizens, quote unquote, what can we do to make pressure on governments and the energy market in order to see a reconsidering of current strategies? And then finally back there. Uh, my name is Andras Limet, I'm from Hungary. You have been criticizing neoliberalism and globalization. So what would be uh, the solution in Europe? And what do you think about the stakeholder capitalism? Is it a working option or not? State capitalism. Stakeholder, stakeholder capitalism. Stakeholder. Stakeholder capitalism. Okay, okay four questions out okay. there. <laughs> Joe, back to you. Okay, let, uh, let me uh, try to answer uh, as much as I can in a few minutes. Um, the, um, one interesting aspect of what is going on right now is that uh, even though I've been critical of um, uh, how the neoliberal model has impaired the ability of Europe to respond and imposed enormous costs on European citizens, in fact, uh, there are, uh, the model is so bad that the, many of the, you might call it the strictures, the dogma of neoliberalism are putting, being put aside. So you have an intellect, you, cognitive dissonance is running wild in Europe uh, in a way that I find very interesting. So at the one hand, you're keeping sort of, you're, you're, you're on the energy market, you're have, talking about caps, uh, you're doing things that are really outside of that framework, but you're not thinking for, about it from first principles, so you're not doing enough to change the model. And the result of that is some really strange things. You have uh, Germany uh, nationalizing a major company you're having massive state aid, which is against all the principles of the single market. Uh, in the United States, uh, we, having spent 40 years castigating China for industrial policy and telling people at the World Bank and IMF don't use industrial policy, passed a $250 billion industrial policy bill to produce more chips and other things in the United States ideology is sort of being set aside in an incoherent way. And the international institutions, when the United States uh, passed the CHIPS Act, 
uh, almost no one said, is this consistent with the WTO? The WTO was viewed as irrelevant because when we do it, it's justified. While when China does, totally unjustified. So we, we are beginning to live in a world of intellectual incoherence. And I think it's that in a way because neoliberalism is a broken model, but people are finding it difficult to leave it. And uh, they don't have another mooring uh, on, on which um, to rest. Uh, so the, uh, one of the things that uh, is going to be, a, there, there are going to be many consequences of the uh, dramatic rise in the interest rates. Uh, I think it's going to put a lot of stress on the euro. Obviously, countries with high debt GDP ratios are going to be finding it difficult, uh, and there are several, and particularly those countries that have not, uh, uh, where their debt is publicly held and they have short maturity structures. So, and, and that means that looking at different countries, they have different maturity structures, different amounts of debt. It's going to be very variable. But in the third world, I think we're going to see a lot of debt crises, and that's going to, again, color the global response to what uh, is going on. Um, the, one of the uh, responses uh, to... Uh, one of the, I, mean, I thought a, a good question was, what can ordinary citizens do to uh, change this? And I, I think uh, the first is to recognize the nature of the problem. And, and what is a, uh, Europe and America is at war. Wartime economies are different than peacetime economies. The neoliberal doctrines never made any sense, but they become particularly problematic in the midst of a war, that the kind of incoherent response is creating all kinds of tensions and inefficiencies, inequities, and that rethinking the model in a more systematic way is, which you can do, I mean, we had the tools, we can do it. You can do the reforms in the energy market a lot better than the way that they are, uh, have been done. The broader issue on um, uh, the nature of capitalism, uh, you know, it, where is stakeholder capitalism going, um, that was supposed to be uh, a softer version of capitalism in the United States. You know, uh, Friedman, uh, 50 years ago, 52 years ago, wrote an article about uh, shareholder capitalism. The only objective of capitalism is to maximize shareholder value. And if you make money off of causing an opioid crisis or uh, a childhood diabetes crisis, that's their problem. Your duty is to your shareholder. And particularly in the short run, because the markets are supposed to look forward, and if you make money now, that's that's all you need to focus on because the market is for, uh, that view obviously has been rejected, that shareholder capitalism. But stakeholder capitalism is an improvement over that where you supposedly look at your customers, your environment, your workers. Uh, it's a much improvement, but stakeholder capitalism, American style, has a lot of greenwashing in it. That is to say, the rhetoric says, I care about my customers, I care about the environment, until it hits my bottom line very much. So green light bulbs are great. They don't cost very much, and I can talk about how, by putting green light bulbs, I've saved a little bit of money. But I've been in seminars with banks where, as they praise how they put in green light bulbs, they're lending for coal. So I have some skepticism. Uh, it's better than shareholder capitalism, but it's not enough. And finally, uh, let me uh, say, you know, 
how does anybody looking at the United States understand what's going on? And the answer is you can't. Um, the, the fact is that one of the two parties has largely become a cult. And uh, the best way to understand what's going on is to read some stuff about Salem witchcraft or, or something like that. How do societies get caught in a cult? One of the two parties, 80% of their voter, other members, major party, believes the election was stolen, uh, is enthralled with QAnon, doesn't believe in science, doesn't believe in experts, and has created a culture of their own and a lens through which they see the world. And it is such a different lens that, you know, I think most of us don't know how to break into their worldview. So if you don't believe in science and you're trying to explain about climate change, how do you do it? <laughs> uh, if you're an anti-vaxxer and you don't believe in science, how do you, how do you reach them? And those are really hard questions and, and questions that, um, you know, as Americans or foreigner, you know, uh, non-Americans, I don't think there's any answer. But there's a very strong implication, I think, for Europe that with this being such a dominant cult in the United States and with America's very flawed democracy where we don't have majority control, we have minority control, we have gerrymandering, we have voter suppression, we have laws that are designed to make sure that a minority controls the country, unless, you know, it, uh, designed 200 and some years ago by rich white male slave owners. So we have a, a, a political system that is dysfunctional. And that means Europe has to rely on its own defense forces. And uh, the world has to rely on Europe for the preservation of human rights and democracy that you cannot look across the water. I hope things work well in the United States, obviously. You know, uh, for me, for my family, for everybody I know. But uh, I think uh, that gives an even greater importance that Russia gets defeated in this uh, war of aggression. Joe, thank you very much. Uh, we are now going to have uh, a coffee break. Uh, till 10:20. Uh, this was this was fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time. And as Joe at the very beginning said, uh, he will give a lecture tomorrow night uh, at the Technische Universität within the framework of the Vienna Humanities Festival. You do have a program of the Humanities Festival. So those of you who are already not aware, please do inform yourself. There's a, a terrific week and a terrific weekend lined up. So please join me in thanking Joe.